I want to talk with you about Jesus' resurrection and ask the question, what went wrong? Here in America, we live in an increasingly non-Christian culture. We have a huge number of churches, massive number of television, radio, and internet ministries. And yet, in the midst of all of this, we see fewer and fewer church growers who are even able to describe the gospel in its simplest terms. Uh, many churchgoers are more articulate about their political beliefs than they are about biblical truths. Addiction, abortion, uh, racial tensions, they're all on the rise. Among churchgoers, far more money is spent every year on personal pleasures than is invested in kingdom business. When we take a look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the books that follow in the New Testament after, we see a radical difference between how people followed Christ then and how Christians in America follow him today. Something has gone wrong. Jesus Christ came to establish the kingdom of God on earth in you and me, in our communities, in our political systems, in our judicial systems, and in every level of culture. Yes, over the years there have been ebbs and flows when it comes to Christian influence in the culture. But today, in America, we are at the lowest point of Christian influence that we have ever seen in our nation's history. We live today in a world that is filled with churches and yet lacks the power of the kingdom of God. We live in a culture that has many, many Bibles, but lacks, lacks an articulate expression of biblical truth. What has gone wrong? I want to propose to you four simple things that have begun to take place that have eroded over the years the influence of the church in our modern culture. Then I want to share with you how we can fix that. And I want to end in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 to 7. So what's gone wrong? How have we gone from being one nation under God to becoming a nation that talks about God but lives for itself. And I'm including here many who attend church on a regular basis. How have we adopted a form of godliness while denying its power? One, we become more impressed with God's blessings than we have with God himself. America is truly a blessed country. We have seen incredible blessings in every single area medically, educationally, social reforms, though it doesn't look like that right now. We have seen incredible blessings financially. And yet for many who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on Sunday, Monday through Saturday, we are more impressed with the gifts of God than we are with God himself. Many spend more time looking at their financial balance than they do looking at the scriptures. Many spend more time worrying about their 401k than they spend in prayer. Many of us spend more time planning our vacation than we do planning on sharing the gospel with a neighbor. We have become enamored with the blessings of God while at the same time pressing the presence of God out of our lives. Second, we began to believe that God's blessings were actually a result of our own efforts. This has become such a gross overstatement in the lives of the church that we even have entire ministries that have built around the concept that you produce the blessings of God, either by your words or your positive attitude or your innate abilities since you are now a Christian. We have begun to take credit by our efforts for what God has given to us. We lack humility and we live in a state of pride as if God owes us because of all of the sacrifices we made when we gave that two dollars to that guy or that gal standing on the corner holding the sign, we'll work for food. We have exchanged the humility that comes from receiving the gifts of God with pride in believing that those gifts are earned and deserved by us. 
Third, we've replaced submission to God with our own form of humanistic spirituality. We have taken the Word of God apart and we have accepted and digested the blessings and the promises we like while ignoring the commands that we dislike. We are not necessarily worshiping the God of the Bible. We are worshiping a God of our own creation. We as Americans have exchanged the truth of God for the lie of a humanistic spirituality, something that makes us feel good when we sing the songs, but does not press our conscience when we are lying to co-workers, to spouses, or anyone around us. And fourth, well, Americans tend to adopt an image of God that best suits their immediate needs or their life experiences. We have gone from believing in the God of the Bible to creating a God that fits the image that we like. A friend of mine says that if God never tells you you're wrong, then the God you're really worshiping is yourself. We don't want a God that tells us to sacrifice. We don't want to serve a God that tells us we can't have everything we want. We don't want a God who demands that we put the needs of others before ourselves. In reality, we don't want a God, many of us, do not want a God who demands racial equity, who demands that we take care of the widow and the orphan, who demands that we give up our rights for the rights of others. And so we have created a God who better fits the image and the immediate needs that we have. A God who loves us, a God who kisses our owies, a God who makes us smile, and a God who always, always thinks we're right. This sort of God, this created image, is a false God, no more real than the images that are worshiped by others around the globe. The reason that the power of the gospel and the resurrection is lost in our culture is because its reality has been lost in our churches. Many ministers, and I am a minister, have become so consumed with building numbers in the church, with building finances in the bank account, that we have begun to shade the truth to form what people want to hear. As a result, we see congregations grow, yet we don't see people grow spiritually. We see opportunities to advance a person's career in the ministry expand, but we don't see the kingdom of God expanding in our neighborhoods around us. It is not that the revolution Jesus began was fraudulent. It's not that the revolution Jesus began in the resurrection is without purpose and meaning. The fault is found in the fact that we, his followers, have faltered when it comes to standing up for truth. We have failed to submit ourselves to God and we have chosen to live like the world and expect God to put his stamp of approval upon it. How do we fix this? How do we in a country that it's tearing itself apart find a way to heal? How do we living in a country that is divided by every single theology, ideology, and philosophy finally come to a place where we treat people with the respect and the dignity they were created with? How do we as a country finally begin to honor the lives of the unborn rather than take them at the altar of expediency? Today's American culture closely mirrors that of Jesus' own day, just prior to his death and resurrection. So how do we live in light of Jesus' death and resurrection and reach a culture that is needlessly living in darkness? How do we do it? Well, a look at the Jewish religious community, the Roman political community, and Jesus himself and how they viewed life is going to help us understand this. You've read the Gospels undoubtedly. If you haven't, there's four of them and you can read them, no charge. When you look at the lifestyle of the Roman political system, the lifestyle of the Jewish religious community, and the lifestyle of Jesus, 
we see a very real connection to where we are today. The religious leaders of Jesus' day chose, how do you say this right? Let me put it this way. The religious leaders of Jesus' day teach us that you can never underestimate the power of revenge. They were angry because Jesus was telling the truth and stealing people from their religious beliefs. They were upset because Jesus was telling them things they did not want to hear. And they were concerned that if Jesus kept this up, the Roman government would come in and wipe out the Jewish people as a people. And what they did was take revenge on Jesus for being the light in their darkness. And they killed him. It doesn't take a Bible scholar or a church historian to see how much of the religious community in America, of all faiths, mirrors this type of mentality. We have hunkered down into our little groups. We have found that our way is the way and God is behind it. And we begin to live in revenge mode. They said this, we're going to get them good. The difference is that we believe God is on our side. What about the Roman government? I guess you could say that the Roman government teaches us you can never underestimate uh, the deception of self-importance. Rome believed that it was God and that people needed to bow to him. And they were willing to come in and wipe out an entire nation, the Jewish nation, if it stepped out of line. How odd it is that we live in a country of the free, the land of the brave, and yet most of us live in fear. Fear that Big Brother's going to come in and not help us, but hurt us. Enough said there. What about Jesus? In contrast to these two false ways of viewing life, Jesus teaches us through his life, through his teaching, through his death and his resurrection, that we can never underestimate the effect of our dependence upon God. Jesus lived his life in dependence upon God. Jesus affected more lives positively than the Romans or the Jewish culture ever did to this day. Jesus was able to enact the powerful movements of God because Jesus depended on God. Jesus did not expect the Father to bend to his will. In fact, in one of his darkest moments, wanting not to die on the cross, he says, Father, if there's any other way, let's do it. But not my will, your will be done. Let me read to you the prophecy of the coming of Jesus and what it offers to us. And I promise you that if we as Christians will get back to a dependence upon God, rather than a dependence upon our government or our religious institutions, we will see the revolution Jesus began begin to take hold again in our country. Notice what Isaiah writes in chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they have rejoiced at harvest time and as they rejoice in the dividing of spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yokes and the rod on their shoulders and the staff of their oppressor just as you did in the days of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forevermore. What Isaiah prophesied about was the coming of Jesus Christ, this mighty counselor, 
this God who would bring justice and righteousness. Our country right now cries out for justice, cries out for righteousness. We fight amongst ourselves because we are still living in darkness, even though the light of God has shone in the hearts of men. It is not until the church that claims the name of Jesus begins to yield itself again to Jesus that we will be the light in this dark world. Make no mistake, our country is in a horrific time. But make no mistake, Light has shone through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And those men and women who choose to live by the commands of this Jesus will be a light in the darkness of their family, their friends, their community, and their country. Our country is crying out for light in its darkness. Will you choose to live for Jesus and be that light. As you do, we will see the plan that Jesus instituted through the resurrection get back on track, and we will see our nation and our globe become everything it was intended to be. Now, if you're watching this and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in darkness. But Jesus, the light of the world, is shown, and he wants to shine into your life today and make a way for you where right now there seems to be no way. If you're ready to give your life in submission to God and to serve him, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Simply pray, Father, forgive me of the sin of living as if you don't matter. Come into my life and be my God. I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've prayed that prayer like so many others have, I'm going to ask you to send me a quick note. And I'm going to get you some information that's going to help you along the way as you start this new journey, this new lifestyle as a follower of Jesus. So Christian, you and I are living in a country that is falling apart. But perhaps just like Ruth, we were born for such a time as this. Let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. This is not the time to back down. This is the time to live in submission to God and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. As we do, we're going to see the revolution which was begun get back on track. Whatever you're doing today and wherever you're watching this, I'm asking you to remember two very important things. Number one, God loves you very much. And number two, I am proud to be your pastor. The Lord be with you.